Hi everyone, this is Bobo the Vulture, and I've gotten a slightly earlier start than I sometimes do on my recordings. Plus, I got a super nice new car that's super fast and super great, the Escudo Pikes Peak Rally Edition. So, what I'm going to do first is enter an endurance race. Ha ha! All right, what is the worst endurance race slash the one that seems like it would be the best one to do with this car? Um, 200 miles of Laguna Seca. What kind of cars are in this one? As long as I've got this car, I'll go ahead and take care of probably the toughest one I can find. to knock it out of the way. This would seem to be a Super GT style thing, so maybe I won't do that. want to find the all-stars of the game, you know? The, big the heavy hitters, the big boys. This is where the big boys play. This is WCW. Is it the SS route all night? 50 laps. 350 grand. It's not a lot of prize money, is it, folks? Not really. No. But let's see what kind of cars are in this. These are the biggest and baddest the game has to offer. So, there's the R5 special stage all night. Possibly. You know how much I love special stage Route 5. You also know how much I love the Rome circuit. 300 grand. In theory, these are probably not as fast and cool and cool and fast cars. Don't know, though, really. Don't know until you look. Let's look. These would also seem to be the, the same sort of creme de la creme. Hmm. So the big question ends up being two hours or 50 laps. Which do I more feel like doing right now? Also, interesting. This has a horsepower cap, so we can't run in it. And it's in a lower horsepower class. I'm just curious as to what kind of cars are in it. I should learn to not stop speaking as the video is fading out, thinking that it's about to load up. Replay right away. These are all like... I guess what it would consider Grand Touring cars and such. There it is, the BMW 840CI. I always found to be a handsome, handsome hunk of automobile myself. It's in sort of the old-fashioned wedge philosophy. Honestly, it's kind of a front-engined uh, look, Grand Touring spec sort of look of the old BMW M1, which was a mid-engine car from the very early 80s, if I remember right. Possibly the tail, tail end of the 70s, but... Let's do the special stage all night. Let's go all night, folks. All night long. All night. All night long. All night. Now, let's uh, go into set... Wait, do we have a... We don't get to do qualifying here, do we? Well, 
I'm going to change the tires to hard rubber then. Because I don't want to have to uh, change tires all that often. And this is going to be a test, folks. This will be a test of endurance for me, for the car, and for this recording device. really does not want to turn as well as I was anticipating. I think the interesting thing to say here is that it is gripping far more than I expected it to. And it's on the hard tires. I guess that'll all eventually go away. It's maybe one of those cars that you just have to be constantly on the gas or brakes. You constantly have to be giving a communication on what to do. You can't just tell it, like, all right, drift around for a little while. I always forget. Either way, you know... I just want to, uh, I want to get a nice new endurance car, I want to get a nice new car, and, uh, I need to do all these endurance races, and like I said, uh, it's a large snowstorm, so I ended up working from home today, so, my, uh, trip back home on a daily basis, uh, does take me some time, so, that actually did, uh, add a significant amount to, uh, my playtime in the evening here. You know, maybe it's not, because it seems like it's cornering super slow. Maybe it isn't really. Maybe it's just that it gets accelerating so fast that driving around at speeds in which a car could actually theoretically corner, like the acceleration is so explosive, it just doesn't seem right to me. I don't know. Has no headlights that light up though. It's not the kind of car it is. Sorry. So this is a good. This is a good machine. I suppose I should have made, like, elaborate notes about things to talk about uh, during this endurance race. But I did not. I could have used an endurance race like this to uh, hold an informal Q&A with all of you fans at home. 
who I know have lots and lots of questions about Bobo the Vulture, who he is and how he operates. I'll tell you how he operates. Smooth. He's a smooth operator. Smooth operator. Just ask Sade. That's what I do. Getting a little better at figuring out how to handle this thing, just in normal conditions. That air pin is probably perpetually going to be an issue, but still. We're doing okay here, folks. We're gonna be here a while, but we're doing okay. So, I will say, the one thing that kind of, uh, one of the things that really kind of amuses me about, um, The, uh, this car, the Suzuki Escudo Pikes Peak Edition. <coughs> is that, uh, the Escudo is the small sport utility. Well, I mean, small for the North American market. Was a reasonably sized enough vehicle, and depending on what else it's measured up against. That's one of those things. Like, uh, there are cars that are sold in the United States that make sense in terms of how big they are in their native Japan or Europe, whereas here they're like, oh my god, this is some kind of toy car, why is it so tiny? Um, but the Escudo is a uh, it was a sport utility vehicle that was sold in America uh, for a while. It was sold as they made a long version that was called the XL7. But for most of the time that it was sold in the U.S., it was sold as the Suzuki Sidekick. I think later on they started naming them the Suzuki Vitara. I guess because they thought it would just sounded more, I don't know, virtuous or something? I'm not really sure. Even though sidekicks are cool, everybody should have a sidekick. Um, the Suzuki Sidekick, which was also sold by Geo as the Geo Tracker. So, you remember those little, like, two-door sort of convertible Jeep things? They're like one step up from the Samurai Jeeps, basically. Uh, that was the sidekick. And that is what this silhouette formula car is supposed to be. And you can sort of see it in the face. Obviously not in the back of the car anywhere in the rest of it, but... It sort of looks like a Suzuki sidekick slanted backwards and smooshed up all beyond recognition. It's cool that way.
Yeah, I struggle a bit with the low speed corners in this car, but that's okay. It clearly has enough speed to be able to pull us through here. And astonishingly, it has enough grip to just not spin out at every turn, even though it has like 981 horsepower or whatever it is. I remember for a long time thinking, oh, well, one of the reasons the physics on this car are so seemingly skewed in its favor is because it was a it was a car designed for the Pikes Peak Hill Climb, which, you know, it's an off-road race. Well, that's not entirely accurate. Um, the Pikes Peak Hill Climb was, uh, for a very long time, was a part tarmac it started on a uh, paved road and uh, then was not paved the higher up that you went. Um, but uh, I guess it was in 2011 or 2012, not very long ago, they uh, paved the road all the way up to the peak. So it is literally just a, uh, a paved hill climb now. Um, which of course means that uh, it was a big thing to have the record at the Pikes Peak hill climb. Um, of course, now the records have all been shattered because uh, it is much easier to go fast on paved roads. It's much easier to engineer a car to go fast on paved roads than it is uh, on loose gravel. Um, this was made, of course, before the uh, Pikes Peak uh, Hill Climb Road was paved. So, there's that to be considered. I believe the uh, place has an interesting record. Um, Monster uh, here, who made this car, um, did uh, did win a number of times. I believe he, at one point, in time, like he, the last couple of times that he's run, he's actually taken an electric car up. And they made a new category for electric cars, and he aimed for that. Um, I think last year he had a DNF. His car failed to like it had a an electrical malfunction going uh, going along. Um, but. Uh, it used to be considered a part of the USAC championship, which was um, sort of the American championship at the time that the Indy 500 was also a part of, um, or a bunch of sort of Indy car races were a part of. Um, and so actually the the one family name that is synonymous with the Pikes Peak Hill Climb is uh, the Unser family. Um, Rob Unser, Bobby Unser, um, many of them all have uh, victories, overall uh, number ones uh, for you know one given year or another, like Speed Kill Glenn. Um, And then eventually, IndyCars became specialized to the point where people weren't really able to race them on a dirt hill climb. You know, horses for courses. Um, and that was around the time that uh, specialized rally machines, like the ones from the Group B era, um, started making their appearance. Um, there is a there is a video, a short film. It can be seen on YouTube, but also apparently won some critical acclaim in like 1991 or thereabouts, uh, called Climb Dance, and it is literally just a video of a variety of onboard onboard shots of Ari Vatanen, Vatanen, um, in a specialized Pikes Peak Hill Climb uh, Peugeot 403, I think. Uh, 
Um, and uh, the uh, for a number of years in the early 80s, the overall pri pri prize at the Pikes Peak Hill Climb was won by um, various uh, factory Audi drivers in Audi Quattros. Um, Michel Mouton, um, who I think was the uh, first uh, female driver to win a uh, major top-level um, motor racing event. Um, I think that that applies across all motorsports. Um, I'm sure it does. I, I know that it applies for the uh, top categories in the World Rally Championship. Um, but I believe she may have been the first anywhere in anything. Um, in 81 or 82. Um, she was an Audi driver. Uh oh. Coming up on my first victim, Sid Vicious. <laughs> I don't think it's actually Sid Vicious, but, uh. But I am coming up on my first lap traffic here. It's the Opal Calibra Touring Car. I am surprised. I would have thought there would be a Lister Storm back here to, uh... I should consider just doing a handbrake turn there every time. I really should. Oh, really? You're gonna bump me from behind? Is that the game we're gonna play? Sour Grapes. You gonna join the Sour Grapes Bunch, huh? On the Banana Splits? No, I don't want to enter the pits right now. Though at this point, it might have been faster to do so. Man, I lost that entire straightaway. I was probably a lap two of work. I'm thinking I can get these tires out to lap 25 based on their wear. Although they're starting to turn yellow and it is not lap 20 yet. It seems like they they are sort of in the green for a long time, then they go from yellow to orange to red like super fast. I'll be so much happier if this were an endurance race of the... Uh, Clubman R11. So, yeah. Um, and of course, uh, the other impact of the sort of it's, 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 it's definitely more of a rally thing now. Um, I mean, it always sort of was. That's the kind of course it is dancing up a mountain peak. Um, but, uh, yeah, they paved it in, uh, like, 2001 or 2002, and, uh, the big reason it got paved, actually, was, shockingly, the Sierra Club really wanted it to be paved. You would think, what? But they paved Paradise and put up a parking lot. I thought that was the whole thing. Or they didn't, like, the environment to be ruined that way. Um, but apparently, uh, they demanded it be paved because the loose gravel was, uh, causing, uh, other, um, like the throwing up of loose gravel by vehicles driving up and down that road. Because you can also just drive up it and down it, apparently, um, during non-race times. I actually would really like to do that someday. Um... I mean, one day I'll get to do a road tour of the West. I'd like to go out and see the Pikes Peak um, course, and I would like to go out on the Bonneville Salt Flats, which is where they set land speed records, folks. It's a... Basically, it's a dry lake bed in uh, Utah. And... Uh, 
it's a wide open space where, like, you know, like a couple miles around, um, there is nothing to hit, basically. So you can take your car out there and try and go as fast as it is possible to do. Man, these the wheels are starting to come off here. It feels like the car is still really gripping, it's just that it's not handling quite the way I would like. You would think I would be used to that by this point. Feeling like that freaking Calibra is about to sneak up behind me again. Freaking Calibra. That's right, I'm talking about you. What are you gonna do? Oh, that person was stopping for tires. Okay. After 16 laps. I don't know how 16 goes into 50. I'm not positive of that person's strategy, but they may well have one, so. Bully on them. See, it just seems to be, uh... I just operate better when there is no pressure of other cars around. Not spinning out as randomly now. Because I'm like, oh, I need to make sure that I'm not, you know, causing troubles for that Calibra. So, it should be possible with this car to lap the entire field over an endurance race, I imagine. I might not end up doing that, because I'm not the best in the world. And as it is showing, this is not necessarily the best car for every course. Definitely for, well, for dirt racing, I imagine, uh, after this, I might actually take this out and do some of the, uh, you know, dirt races. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out whether or not these tires will last till lap 50, or 25. Uh, they're starting to look a little peaked. But again, the car has not been handling necessarily as sort of superbly as uh, you might have thought it would. I mean, it's being made up for by the, I mean, there's no other word, the explosive acceleration. It is explosive. Just bam, out of a cannon. Every time. So it's got that going. Oh, also, um, yeah, so the, the Pikes Peak uh, Hill Climb course uh, has been entirely paved now, so of course, the year that happened, um, all the old records were broken. 
um, and they're still being rewritten now. Um, I believe the uh, record of Pikes Peak International Hill Climb now is held by. Uh, uh, oh, this is gonna. I can't believe the name just left my head. He's like the. He's like the greatest rally driver in history. He's a Frenchman, Sebastian Loeb. He may or may not actually be the greatest rally driver in history, but he is essentially the most decorated rally driver in history. I mean, you know, like, when people try and say, oh, this person's the greatest of all time, that person's the greatest of all time, it's always a little difficult because you run into the issue of, oh, well, these people, you know, it was a different game in these days, you know. It's like people say, oh, you know, football is a completely different game now from, like, in the 70s or sometime because uh, they changed the rules for roughing passers or something like that. And, like, not so bad after all. This ain't so bad. I'll pass another guy while he was in the, uh, while he was chilling out in the pits. past. I've only uh, lapped a couple of guys on track. But, I mean, I've lapped a number of competitors at this point, but uh, many of them were uh, in getting their tires changed. Which I have not done yet. I still have yet to do. It's coming, folks. As you can tell by my little tire graph uh, directly above my tachometer on the right side of the screen. The tachometer, by the way, in case, I don't mean, I don't know, maybe there's people that don't know many of these basic bits of terminology. The tachometer is the big thing at the bottom right of the screen. Um, it It's the big gauge with the needle on it. Um, and those numbers in it are the speed of the engine uh, expressed in thousands of revolutions of the crankshaft a minute. And, um, there is a big variance in, uh, there's big variance in engine speeds. Um, very big and torquey, um, gas engines, as well as most diesel engines, will have much lower red lines. It's the little portion at the very end of the tachometer gauge there. Um, Alright, I gotta just get more tires. I'm sorry. Oh, it's limited speed, guys. I hope I don't get past. Wouldn't that be a thing, if I did? Got new tires, that's good. Limited speed. So I didn't make it to 25, so the question is... I mean, my strategy is all off in terms of being the absolute lowest time. Um, 
Do I think that these can last more than half the race? Probably not. I'm probably just going to need to make an extra stop. It's going to have to be a two-stop race, not a one-stop race. That's okay, folks. I think I can still manage it. I mean, clearly still can't get through some of these turns. Hey, they went from blue to green, like, instantly. Yeah, Sebastian Loeb uh, now holds the record in the Pikes Peak. Well, I mean, he did as of the time that I've recorded this. Maybe somebody else has gone and done it now. Um, in a uh, in a sort of specially modified uh, Peugeot. It apparently took the. Uh, I read on Wikipedia, I don't know if it's true, but that it took the rear wing off of the Peugeot 908 um, Le Mans prototype, and then has a bunch of other different body parts on it. It's not the same engine, for sure, because I believe it was a gas engine in the uh, Pikes Peak Hill Climb car, whereas the uh, Le Mans car was a diesel engine prototype. Basically, a few years back in the sort of late 2000s, there was a push to um, make uh, diesel engined uh, Le Mans prototypes. It was basically a readjustment of the rules to uh, give a certain to give a certain benefit to uh, diesel engine prototypes. So, um, Audi were the big competitors at the time, so they got on board with that, and uh, Peugeot challenged them in uh, some years that followed. Uh, and they got the better of the Audis here and there, but on the measure, the Audis were still sort of number one. But, uh, it was a good give and take. It was a very good rivalry. Um, up until, uh, Peugeot pulled the plug because they didn't have, uh, money in the Great Recession to, uh, be spending on race car program. Or it was bad for press. I mean, you know, yes, those racing programs do take considerable money, but compared to the overall operating margins of a global car manufacturer, it's not that much. And I mean, it's interesting sometimes where the money goes. I remember having heard at one point in time, um, well, yeah, I'm a big fan of F1. Um, as you may know. Uh, but... The... Sorry, I got completely lost trying to get through the hairpin there. You know how it is. But, uh... In the... Early, yeah, well, in the 2000s, basically, there was uh, a, a Formula One team uh, from Jaguar. The uh, the team has actually gone on and changed forms to become the Red Bull F1 team, which struggled for a while, but uh, since picking up uh, chief designer Adrian Newey, and uh, they have signed driver Sebastian Vettel, um, they've pretty much become the unbeatable car driver combination of tomorrow. Uh, well, of today. Um, 
but many years ago it was the Jaguar Formula One team, and uh, you know uh, F1 drivers are highly paid uh, athletic celebrities. Well, sometimes they are. It's interesting. There is a uh, there is a discrepancy. Like some of them will be very highly paid and sought after professionals, whereas others will literally have to bring money to the team. Um, they will have to pay to drive, in a sense. Sometimes it's out of their own pockets, sometimes it is in that, like, they can find a personal sponsor to then donate gobs of money to the team. It's crazy that way, folks. It's just crazy. Don't shoot, they're crazy! Um... And at one point in time, in the 2000s, you know, uh, apparently there was a board of Ford executives, because at the time, Jaguar was owned by Ford. And they were going down a list of, um, of employee salaries. And, like, you know, they, they were expecting, like, oh, well, I'll see you, you're on the board, and I'll see you, you're another executive chairman, and so on and so forth. They are expecting to see the names of all the like big wigs in the offices in Dearborn, the same as them. I'm passing you again. I'm double passing you. Double tap. Um, but at the top of the list, highest uh, salary, biggest check issued out by Ford Motor Corporation was issued to a man named Eddie Irvine. Eddie Irvine was their chief Formula One driver. Formula One teams will generally have a number one and a number two driver. Um, usually, whichever one is faster, on balance, will sort of be given preferential treatment because, uh, you know, the team's ambition is to get. Well, the team's ambition is to win the, the Constructors' Championship, which is, you know, like, the combined scores uh, from both of their cars. But it's also a huge prestige thing, and I think most fans tend to better remember who the championship driver was any given year. So they're also going after that driver's championship. And so, in doing that, they'd be like, well, this is the guy that's slightly faster. Um, we want to sort of, you know, if the two of you are running first and second, uh, you know, the guy who's slightly slower, if he happens to be leading that race due to some circumstance or another, but he's sort of farther behind in overall points in the championship, they might ask him, hey, maybe you could move back to second place so the first place guy can widen his margin a little more. And, you know, People get very up in arms about it. They think it's very unsporting. Other people think it's just part of the game. It's part of the machinations. I don't know. I tend to have a fondness for the number two driver people. So I will sometimes feel bad about how that ends up working out. You know, I mean, they're, they're in a support role. They're helping out. They're doing things. They're contributing to the team. I think it's always very admirable. I always get very high hopes in uh, the world of Formula One when somebody who was a number two driver or somebody else then, like, ends up leaving and going to another team and doing other stuff. And I always want to see, like, oh man, are they going to be able to, like, carve out a niche as the lead driver in this new place? That'd be great to see. And sometimes those things work out and sometimes they don't. Hey, there was another super fast prototype car. Yeah, 
Yeah, sorry, you're having to stay behind me through this sort of snaky section, which is uh, one of the places I imagine that I am the slowest and just most difficult to be just driving behind. I look like some kind of crazy road hog. I can't help it, man. It's this car, it's so wacky. It's wacky wild Kool-Aid style. I mean, look at it, it's big, it's red. It just wants to hop through a door and go, oh yeah! Come on, let's get through this. You and me together. Okay, there we go. Oddly enough, uh, I've had nothing to drink tonight. I think in one or two videos previous, I'd mentioned, oh, I had a beer or two before I started driving. And this is the one where I'm going all over the place. It's because it's the driving of the unreal, fast, crazy car, but still. It is interesting to note. Yep, I totally make up all my time right here. Yep. He wasn't that much faster than me through that turn, actually. Just trying to get the power down out of uh, that hairpin can be a uh, hairy. There we go. Jeez, again with this. I want a clean lap where I can get where I can get this kind of headway. And that will allow me to do my thing. Because, you know, I'm not trying to get in anybody's way. I'm trying to just be so far ahead of everybody, I'm not even a factor for all you guys. But I'm so much ahead of you now, that it is turning out to be a crazy factor. You know what I haven't seen on the track? I haven't seen any of the Jaguar um, XJR15s. I haven't seen any of those. Wait, is it XJR15s, the ones that are in this? I think so. I sometimes... It's something that I find a little bit unfortunate about the way that some car companies name their cars. In a way, like, oh, okay, it makes a lot of sense if you understand the numerology and nomenclature behind it. Like, oh, the BMW 3 Series, that the, the ones that start with a 3, um, that designates the body style. It is their sort of smallish getting to be almost midsize, but not really. They're compact, they're not subcompact, but they're sort of compact-ish. Uh, design and then uh, 25 means oh the engine is two and a half liters or 2.5 liters in displacement. Well, that used to be what it is. Now they do things like oh well it's turbocharged, so it's the equivalent of having an engine of this size. So we're going to name it this number. Well, that's not actually the displacement of the engine. So you get in all kinds of tricky situations like that too. But, you know, you'll have things like the, uh... You'll have things like the BMW E550 AMG, or something like that. And like, oh, I can tell that that's a really cool car because it has the AMG designation and the E-Series is a nice stand and better, better, better. 
rather than like, hey, it's a Mustang. It has a name that you can sort of remember. It's catchy or whatever. I mean, heck. Acura, as a as an example, used to have, and they weren't even good names. They were like those, like sort of made by like focus group kinds of names that don't actually mean anything, but they sound good. They used to have the well, I guess Vigor was an actual one, and that did mean something. They had Vigor and Le like yeah, they had like the Integra. Which sounds cool. It sounds like integrity or something like that. I had the Integra and the Vigor and the Legend. And, like, they're not the greatest names, but at least you know what they are. And, like, many of those cars, um. were, you know, like, they're not. I mean, they were fine cars, they're good cars. They aren't necessarily the kinds of cars that made a lasting impact on, like, society or anything, and yet, like, I remember their names because they had names. Whereas, I'm sitting here trying to remember, wait, was the Jaguar XJR15 the Jaguar that looked really cool and is in this game but was never actually raced as a Le Mans prototype because it didn't have the because the rules changed, or something like that, or Jaguar ran out of money, I forget. Or was the XJR15 the car that actually raced as a Le Mans prototype in the 80s, in the Group C days, um, that took a title here or there? I mean, like, Dodge Viper. Nobody's gonna forget, like, oh, what's a Dodge Viper? Oh, right. It's that friggin' thing. Dodge Viper. And interestingly enough, like, Chrysler now has the 300... I, I say interestingly enough. I imagine it may not actually be that interesting for people. Of course, I keep saying that, but people keep watching these videos. I'm not making you watch them. I mean, somebody specifically asked me in a comment earlier in this series. Hey, you gonna do... I mean, it's probably happened more than once. People would be asking, like, hey, you gonna do any more endurance races? That'd be fun. I guess they didn't specifically say that'd be fun, but, like... If you're asking somebody, hey, are you going to do more of this? The, the presumed reason you're asking is because you want to see it. Not like, oh, are you going to do more of this? If so, I know to stop watching the series now. Because I think endurance races are terrible. They're a blot on our civilization. They're a blot on our civilization, too. They're a blot on Civ 4, and so on, and so on, and so on. Ha ha, lols. Broke too late, but that's okay. Is that the Calibra again? Am I going to lap the Calibra a third time? Probably not, because I'll be probably pitting for tires soon, because I'm going to need some before the end of the race. These will definitely give out before 12 laps are up. That is the Calibra again. And he's still trying to give me his attitude. I don't appreciate it. I don't appreciate your guff, son. You are multiple laps down. You need to remember.
kind of want to get enough of a lead on those guys that I don't have to worry about uh, them passing me, even though obviously these wouldn't be passes for position. But yeah, it's possible to lap the field. I may or may not be doing that. Probably not. I believe I've heard people um, brag and say that it, they've lapped the field twice. And I could see that, conceivably. I'm not doing it here. It's not happening here, but, you know. Miracles of tuning your car up properly. You know, let me go ahead and go in and get the... Whoa! Let me go ahead and get that pit stop done, although clearly that was not the best pit entry in history. Who's that guy that's going to go by here? Oh, it's the Calibra again. I get around the Calibra. Calibra. Calibra, Calibra. Yeah. If you folks have been following carefully enough to know which uh which of the dots are which out there on the track uh at this point in time, I salute you. Don't know what you're doing using uh skills like that to watch a Gran Turismo video, but, uh, I mean, by all means, let's settle down. Have a mug of tea. Oh, man, I could murder a mug of tea right now. All right, so, I may treat myself to a nice hot drop after this event. Oh, come on, come on. Let's get used to having good tires again. There we go. That's the spirit. Spirit. That was another one. Dodge Spirit. Absolutely unremarkable sedan from Dodge from the K-Car eras. The bad old days. Dodge Spirit. Although they did make a Spirit RT model that had a ridiculously turbocharged engine on it and made it super fast. just an American convention, is it? To have cars that have names? No, because the Suzuki is an Escudo. That doesn't mean anything, does it? Actually, I think Escudo was like a currency in olden times or something, wasn't it? I remember at one point in time really wanting a Suzuki XL7, which was a later version of the Suzuki Swift. Not Swift, the uh, Suzuki um, Sidekick. It was the Geo Tracker was the other one. It's a later version of the Suzuki Sidekick, um, which was called the Vitara, but then they made an extra long version that had a uh, third row seat so that it seated seven. But it was still like a sort of tiny-ish.
But, you know, it was, um... It was a compact SUV, the, uh... The Suzuki Vitara slash XL7 slash the rest of them. It was a compact SUV, um... That was based off of old-fashioned truck, you know, technology. It had permanent full-time four-wheel... Like, it had permanent... Not permanent. It had a four-wheel drive system as opposed to an all-wheel drive system. Um, it was not based off of a car chassis, as an increasing number of the SUVs, especially the small SUVs around it at the time, were being... Uh, transferred to. That was a big trend that was initially established, I believe, by the Toyota RAV4. Um, they may not have been the first ones to do it, but I think they were the first ones to hit it big with the idea. Um, the Toyota RAV4 was based off of the same platform as a Celica, I think. Um, But it was an SUV, and I mean, you know, there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with it. I mean, they were stylish. Um, if you weren't using it to go off-road, it did pretty much everything else that you would need uh, an SUV to do. They were sort of... I think the big thing is that they did everything that you would want a minivan or station wagon for, but they didn't have the stigma of being a minivan or station wagon. Honestly, I really like minivans and station wagons just because they're honest about their utility. And they have friggin' shit tons of utility. I mean, a station wagon is so much more useful than a regular sedan. You can fit so much more stuff into the back of it. Um, carrying tall things or pieces of furniture without problem. And then the rest of the time, it is... I mean, there's almost zero compromise in terms of, uh, oh, it pretty much, other than that, is the exact same as a sedan. Just that there is this slight bit of glass that goes outward instead of, like, falling down into a trunk. It's one of the reasons that, like, anytime I hear people saying, like, oh, I'm gonna buy a Volkswagen Jetta, I'm always like, well, why would you do that? You could totally get the Golf get a four-door Golf, and it will cost less and be more, like, useful. And people don't necessarily want to hear it. And all that said, you know, I might one of these days end up buying a Jetta. The uh, go-fast version of the Jetta, the GLI, actually runs cheaper than the go-fast version of the Golf, the GTI. Some would argue it's not as good which, you know, they may have a point, but then again, if it's good enough, it's one of those things, uh, you know, you, you, you get what you can afford. At the moment, I might be able to afford either one of them. Last time I was going to buy a car, I was really interested in getting one of them, and I wouldn't have been able to afford either one. starting to get the hang up. Spoke too soon. Why does that happen literally? Like, I was not planning that. Like, that was not a, like, haha, funny gag. I'm about to spin out. I'm gonna start saying I'm really getting the handle of driving this car. It was literally, I thought that I was doing well. playing near the limits of its adhesion or whatever, and no. Smack you down! No! Bat! So. There we go. 
Come on. Ah, let's let's go. There we are. This car pretty much in this hairpin will just keep gliding until it touches a wall, I guess. Is the is the take home lesson. Just don't expect it to do anything else and you won't be disappointed. Again, I'm not necessarily worried about losing this race. I'm more interested in, eh, what'll it be like? How much can I lap people? What kind of car will I receive? I know I'll get some cash prize. I just felt like taking the Escudo. You know, because last time we tried it out in the money-making race once, just so I could show you how awesome cool it is, I felt like actually stretching its legs a little bit. And you can see it's... It is still a sickeningly overbalanced car in terms of like, oh my god, look at how fast I can race against the other fastest cars in this game. But it's still, it's not like some like super easy thing to drive. It's pretty easy to drive considering how powerful it is though. I mean... One of the other big cars in this horsepower league is that drag GTR. You can't even get that thing to turn. Interestingly enough, seems to be one of the problems with this, too, is that... There we go. Get ahead of it, leading into here. And he's just gone, man. There's that Nissan Le Mans prototype that I believe I've passed on an occasion or two already. I feel like there must be some way to do a nice controlled slide through that hairpin that I just didn't find in the previous 48 times that I've gone through there with this car, this go around. Um, but uh, it's okay, folks. We're gonna be okay. It's a matter of uh, by how much I beat everybody. I'm curious to know how much I beat everybody. That was a bad way through those turns, though. Yes, I'm giving you turn-by-turn -turn analysis. Turn-by-turn -turn directions! Turn right now. At the end of this turn, turn right. And the straightaway, turn right, then left, then right again. Then a long right, followed by going straight forever. That's right, it's like Soshi in here. Go straight forever. Haha. <laughs> yeah, people really have sort of, uh. Not. Well, I mean, it's current now. By the time this video goes up, I believe the Olympics will probably be over. But, uh, at least from the thick of them right now, it does really seem as though. People are not really forgetting as much, or remembering as much about the whole, like, ah. Uh, don't want the gay people here. Well, by all means, come here, but don't, you know, be gay in front of children. That would be bad. Um. But, uh, 
doesn't really seem like there's been a whole lot of issue about that. It's been mostly like, ah, oh my god, the slope style course is so dangerous. Or, um, oh man, somebody got locked in the bathroom. They had to punch their way out. Or here's a vine of an Olympian who had a happy response to the team result and then an upset response to the individual result. But that's okay, folks, because I got a happy result right here. Cross the finish line! Yeah, there we go. I speak version GG. Okay, I did lap everybody twice. Well, that's nice. Oh, he's down to one lap. But yeah, they're all two laps. Right? Yeah, we're not watching all that again. Come on. Come on. I wouldn't even find that interesting. I just did it. So I'm interested to see what kind of special car I win for the... Uh, for this event. Let's speed it up here. New Gark Wired. Yeah, let's save the game. I don't even know whether or not this video will record. I'm still saving the game. You suckers will just have to believe that I won that endurance race. Suckers! Nah, no, it should be fine. I have faith and confidence in this recording device, at least my, in my new settings. We'll see whether or not that's all well-founded, too. Let's continue. Let's go to the garage and check out what's in the garage. Now that I won, I had acquired a new car. I want to see what it is. It's pretty exciting, guys. Hey, girls. It's exciting to you, too. It's exciting to everybody who's watching. I mean, if you are watching, hopefully this is going to be exciting. Because I won an endurance race. I don't know what else you could... <gasps> it's the Cerbera LM edition. You remember that from the other game, right? Yeah, super, super fast and super, super smooth. And no information. I may or may not use this car for something at some time. Yeah. I should probably at least see whether or not it's good for the uh, money-making race. That's what I do, apparently. When I get a super fast, super cool car, I'm like, let's see how I can make money. It would... Yeah, that would be cool. We'll see it anyways, folks. We'll check all this stuff out next time. And until then, though, this is Bobo the Vulture. This is Let's Play Gran Turismo 2. I thank you very much for watching, and I will see you all next time. We did another Enduro, folks. Bye!